Straight ahead, we have a powerful conversation paying tribute to one of the most passionate and influential figures in the world of golf. You'll never think of a yellow bat in quite the same way after you hear these thoughts about the passing of Carl Rose Jr. Straight ahead. There are times when we get together for this program that are more pleasant than other times. This one comes on the heels of a rather shocking turn of events that has led to the, the loss of one of, I think, the most impactful figures and names on the golf scene, not just in the state of Michigan, but around the country um, in the sudden passing of Carl Rose. Uh, my friend Brian Minbiel, who spent 32 years with Callaway, reached out to me and said, hey, let, let's talk about this guy for a bit. Let's talk about our unique experiences with him. And I invited Brian then to kind of put together a panel of others who, ha who had over the years gotten to know Carl really well. So Brian, thanks for having the idea and for reaching out. Um, and why don't I have you kind of introduce our other two guests and then we'll kind of, we'll kind of dive into the, to the eulogy part of this conversation. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Bill, and uh, your responsiveness to my inquiry and request is uh, is greatly appreciated. Um, Carl Rose is a, an amazing figure within our industry, and there's more to him than what you would have heard with the gruff voice on the commercials or seen the caricatures or, or heard of his reputation. Um, and the two people we have joining us, um, I'm, I'm very grateful that they accepted the invitation. Um, We'll start. Jim Bulow is um, was the Footjoy rep for a number of years, uh, and is the gold standard for how sales reps are judged, not only in Michigan but elsewhere. Um, I, I think he's the best ever at what he did, and the respect that Carl and the entire Carl's Golf Land uh, team had for Jim uh, is unmatched. Uh, Pete Line, uh, who is with us, uh, rose from being. Carl Rose's dad's caddy at Forest Lake mm -hmm. to being virtually the, the soul and the heartbeat of the entire operation. And uh, as I have stated, you know, before there was a computer, before there was the internet, before there was TrackMan, uh, Pete Line ran a multi-million dollar business um, from his office. And Jim and I have worked extensively with Pete over the years and Pete's calm demeanor and how he handled uh, what was a pretty rowdy organization at times at Carl's um, gave him a position in our industry that was very, very quiet, very, very understated, but that does not limit the power and the influence he had in our business. So uh, I think each of us has a unique perspective on Carl, and I look forward to the opportunity to have each of us share our feelings on this uh, incredible man. Yeah, thank you for introducing kind of the starting lineup and to color in a little bit more of the, the story for Brian's background, 32 years with uh, Callaway Golf, began working in golf in the Detroit market at the age of 14 and navigated Callaway from uh, kind of a almost a novelty niche brand to being the number one vendor at Carl. So all of those relationships take place through the prism of business. I mean, all of you guys are connected because of business. And yet, obviously, this gathering is about the personal side of it all. So for Brian, let me have you start. When did when did you start to realize that this was more than just handing over an invoice and begging for shelf space at Carl's and develop these relationships? Well, uh, and Pete has heard this, and I don't know if Jim has, so I'll be interested to see his response to this. Uh, I am out at Callaway headquarters in Carlsbad. I've just been hired. This is uh, late March. And um, I'm in the office with Bruce Parker, who's our vice president who hired me. Um, and Carl calls and is not too happy that an ex-pro golf guy is getting this Callaway <laughs> um, in the market. And what was Bruce thinking with hiring this guy <laughs> from this operation that he didn't think was was handled themselves in a responsible manner in the marketplace. 
And Bruce's comment was, well, give them six weeks. And if you don't like them, we'll fire them and hire somebody else. <laughs> so when that phone call ends and I'm clearly in shock, Bruce said, there's one guy in this job who can get you fired. And it's Carl Rose. You find a way to make him happy. You'll have a successful career. And from that point forward, I worked diligently to keep that little bald fella happy on Telegraph Road. And I was able to successfully either fool him or navigate the waters for the next 32 years. Is that how you remember it, Pete? Let's just say there was a, in, in my history at Carl's, um, I, I'm 62 now. Uh, his dad hired me when I was 14. Well, he tried to hire me when I was 13. I said, I don't think I can go to work yet. I'm not 14. <laughs> so he said, well, when you turn 14, you know, come and see me. And I did. And uh, so I, I, you know, I've known Carl. I, I knew Carl for 48 years. Um, not all of them. I wasn't there the entire 48. I retired about three years ago. And I also spent five years out at uh, what was then Roger Dunn Golf Shops, being a man, a store manager out there based on my previous experience at Carl's. And that's now Worldwide Golf, which is obviously one of the largest uh, chains in uh, nationwide chains in the country. You know, right, you know, they have Roger Dunn, they have Edwin Watts, um, the Golfers Warehouse and, and many other entities that they bought up in, in the retail uh, landscape. So back to your question, um, there was a lot of times uh, in in my career at Carl's that it was a uh, cleanup on aisle six, <laughs> <laughs> where our 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 young friend Mr. Rose uh, had made a mess of things, whether it be with a vendor or an employee or even a customer, <laughs> and then. <laughs> got to call in, you know, Pete to, you know, kind of figure out how to, how to, you know, sweep up the floor and, you know, you know, put together that, that vendor or that person or, and, uh, you know, Carl was a very, very passionate person. He believed what he believed and, and he, there was no, no gray area. It was white or black. I mean, he, you know, he told you what he thought, what he thought about it, and what he changed his mind through time and uh, and uh, introspection, uh, like he did with Brian Mimbiel, who became one of his most trusted uh, sales reps, because it really is a partnership when a when a retailer works with a vendor. It's it's not once it cannot be one sided because if it is. Nobody wins. Uh, it becomes too uh, too selfish on whether it's the vendor or the uh, retailer. It has to be a community of giving. Well, it strikes me as I as I talk to all of you that all of this relationship took place over a long period of time. It's not as if you you all just came stumbling into the store two years ago and and got to know the latter years version of Carl Jr. You started back when. All of us in the conversation were a whole lot younger. Jim, what do you recall about your first meeting with Carl Rose Jr.? Now, that's an interesting one. I, re I really think uh, I came here in 83. So when I came here, uh, Senior was really running the show. And um, Carl Jr. was active in the store um senior had him doing very similar to what <laughs> very similar to what junior had his young employees doing which was some of the very menial tasks and he learned from the ground up from senior and my real my first experiences with senior and i remember vividly it's interesting you know you do have certain images that that remain in your mind i can't really remember what i had for lunch yesterday as you've heard frequently uh spoken by people as as we age but i remember vividly and probably you're about in 83 sitting in my van with senior and presenting the line 
and he was, I mean, he was just chock full of wisdom. And he was one of the very first retailers that ever um, expressed the desire to acquire inventory. In the past, it was it was a matter of if you sold somebody inventory, he was just hell bent on selling that inventory and not buying any more. Thank goodness, inventory. This inventory is done. Senior, on the other hand, would buy inventory, and he realized the value of inventory. And when you're what you sold him work, boy, he'd come back and he'd reload because he realized the customer, his customer wanted inventory. And that was a way to get them back in the store. So that was really kind of a, um, a revelation to me that, hey, there really are retailers out here that understand the value of inventory. So that was kind of a, that's really my first impression was really of senior. I remember junior interacting with uh, with Junior initially. Uh, but at that point in his life, I'm telling you, he was uh, even then pretty much larger than life. He was, he worked, but he also partied hard, really hard. Oh, yeah. And so you really <laughs> never knew in the morning when I came in, I tried to come in there, you know, early in the day before the store got real busy. And, you know, sometimes Junior would be there and sometimes he wouldn't. So, so, Brian, as you hear your two colleagues uh, with their initial descriptions, I'm struck by a couple of things. One, I think um, I think we might have heard a soft version of the cleanup on aisle six that you can help fill in. Because my guess is when somebody's described as passionate, that means that you're trying your best to euphemistically not tell the stories of the time they peeled the paint off the wall <laughs> in some conversation with you. Um Give me, give me a taste of the fiery side of Carl Jr. Uh, oh, jeez. <laughs> I would say yeah, Everybody. There, there's a couple instances uh, that I know Pete will recall. Um, and just to give you an overview, I can't tell you how many times that Pete and I would look at each other and it was our goal to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. <laughs> because the people he worked for and the people I worked for, there may have been a little bit of combustible nature uh, between them. Uh, and the net result was Pete and I were absolutely committed to Callaway and Carl's being successful, sometimes despite the belief in the behaviors of those above us. Um, we had a sales manager come in in the late 90s. And he was, before becoming sales manager, he was a sales rep in San Francisco. And his name was Dana Schertz. Very successful salesperson. Um, Bruce Parker loved him. And Dana could post numbers. And so at this point, I'm relatively young in the company, six, seven years in, and fighting hard for my biggest retailer, who at that point was a single store entity in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, that meant the world to me, but the reach was nowhere what it would become. And Dana was convinced that there's no retail operation that's under snow four and a half months a year could be doing the volume that I was claiming was potential. So Dana becomes my boss and wants to come visit Golfland and is hell bent into believing that Carl's is a transshipper. So they're getting some merchandise. And I'm thinking, yeah, no better point of exit in a port in a storm than to what are we loading up Canada and Windsor and Sarnia with all this product? And I told Dana under no uncertain terms that the last thing in the world Carl's is, and especially Carl Rose is anything that's not perfectly above board. Now, he may party hard, but his business scruples were unquestionable. Now, define trans shipper for those who are listening and not familiar with that concept. So Carl's had developed a very solid relationship with Callaway when we were allocating products. So Great Big Bertha, you could only get a certain amount of drivers in Fairway Woods each month. And as we were trying to manage inventory against incredible demand, uh, certain retailers got significantly more product. And thus, when there were those who were unable to get as much as they wanted, sometimes it would go retail to retail rather than retail to consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, Callaway as a company did their best to try to satisfy the needs by going on the, the apropos way of doing business. But there were certainly retailers, and maybe Pete was familiar with them out in the West Coast, 
where I wouldn't say all the inventory they got went directly to the consumers who walked through their front door. There may have been as big a shipments going out the back door. So Dana was convinced that I, I was fighting for a retailer who might not be on the up and up. So I prepped Carl and said, you know, here's Dana. Here's what he's about. He's a new leader. And uh, he's kind of of the opinion um, that you might be doing some gray market business. And I think it would behoove us both to put the face forward to let him know that that's not the case. So in a room upstairs at Golfland that Jim Bulow probably spent more time in than any sales rep, the conference room with the big marble table is where we would have meetings at that point. And as I took Dana and took him around the store and all that, as we went up into that room, there were two bats in the middle of this <laughs> marble table, yeah. a plastic one. And then the Hillary and Bradsby with Carl E. Rose etched into the end. <laughs> and as we sit down to the meeting and Dana is a kind of a take charge guy, he is very convinced that he's going to lead this show. And as Pete well knows, uh, none of us got to talk until the, the voice spoke. And Carl, before shaking hands or doing any more, he slammed the plastic bat into the middle of the table. And under no uncertain terms, let Dana Schertz know that Carl's integrity is not to be questioned. He does not transship. And anybody who believes that is not his friend, but is his enemy. Um, I can tell you that got Dana's attention. And the running joke was, is Carl probably had to have that chair reupholstered after that <laughs> meeting, because I'm sure Dana may have left a mark on it as he was scared out of his mind. So yeah. he gave the chance for Dana to choose which bat he wanted to be addressed with. And Carl made his point very quickly. And Pete can let me know if I have embellished at all on that story. It sounds, I mean, sounds like a typical meeting. <laughs> it sounds like a scene out of the untouchables, the teamwork speech. That goes, so yes. <laughs> the, the nice thing about that yellow bat, uh, it was foldable. And we used to take it to the show too. Oh. <laughs> I, I'd have my briefcase and if you know things weren't if things weren't working out you know with a vendor and we we're trying to you know negotiate a deal Carl would say Pete and I you know open my briefcase you know that's back when you carried an actual briefcase you didn't have the man bags and the different you know it, the you know the laptop uh, cases and whatnot so I'd open my briefcase and this yellow bat would unfold and pop out of the briefcase and I'd give it to Carl and we'd continue on with the meeting and, you know, just uh, using the, the best negotiating tactics that we had at the time. It, it is if funny got, that you say that you refer to the show because one of the first times that I was made aware of the, um, the influence and kind of just the power of Carl, uh, both Carl's and the brand was at the PGA show. And I was in a conversation with, and I, I really don't remember who it was. It might have, I think it might have been Taylor Made. And whoever I was speaking with uh, from the PR department, all of a sudden somebody came running up to him and sort of in his ear said something. And he says, I, I'm really sorry. I've got to go, but we've got a major presentation we've got to make. And I said, Oh, well, I thought we were going to record, you know, an interview or do something. And he said, listen, when Carl comes around, you drop what you're doing and you go to Carl. And I didn't even know what that meant at the time, <laughs> but it, it, the, the blanks were filled in a little bit further down the road. And it was almost like, um, it was almost like the sheriff coming into town and kicking open the saloon doors kind of a thing. And I hear there's going to be some trouble in here. And, and, and it was this, um, both a, a combination of respect of admiration and probably a little bit of fear on the part of all of the various manufacturers because, Brian, as you alluded to, this little store had far more reach than it was supposed to. And I can't help but think that that was a combination of, of the father and son teamwork that came out of all of that. So, you know, Jim, I, I'm, I'm curious when you think about how you have seen the reputation of the golf land grow, how do you think the father-son combo helped propel that? Now, it's interesting because, <clears throat> you know, so many businesses pass from father to son, and the son just doesn't have it. You know what I mean? The business just is never really the same. I would, 
Carl Jr. was, if they, I mean, if, if it's possible, I'd almost characterize him as a, a practical visionary. He had the this, this ability to take care of all the small details. He would he would go down to the shoe department and make sure all the shoe boxes were in order by style and size so that when a customer came in and his shoe salesperson was trying to find a shoe for his customer that he'd be able to go over and find out what that shoe, you know, the shoes by size. And when you've got thousands of pairs of shoes back there, you can imagine how important that is to service your customer. And while he was really, and he'd do that himself, by the way, at times, probably to a certain extent to show an example to his employees. But at the same time, he was able to, he recognized um, really the big picture. He understood the importance of brands, both the brands that he carried as well as his own brand. He understood um, competition, who the competition was, who the potential competition was. Did he need to expand? If he did, where would he expand to around the Detroit area? He just, he just had, he had uh, a retail sense I really don't think that you can you can learn. Other than I mean, you have to have a certain. It's just a certain part of it's got to be innate. And then, as he was learning, you know, from his father, I think his father fostered those um, those qualities that he had. And Carl took what was a a very successful operation from his dad. And it became successful on steroids, as you notice. He, he really, you know, the, the internet caught some people by surprise. Carl was willing to invest heavily in the internet and, and all in the in the structure of the business that you know expanded the warehouse, he invested in the internet, all the technical aspects as well as uh, the infrastructure that allowed him to service the internet and he got ahead of everything almost. I mean, he was really at the outset. And then when COVID hit, he was absolutely perfectly, perfectly positioned to take advantage of it. So part of it came from his dad, I'm sure. And part of it just, he just had it. Hmm. It, it strikes me that all three of you are retired and still passionately connected to your relationship with Carl, with both Carls, um, which which to me makes it abundantly clear that this reaches beyond a business uh, relationship, but it's a friendship that you enjoyed. Uh, Brian, when you first um, found out about Carl Jr.'s passing, where were you, and and what was what was your first reaction? Um, I was at Twin Lakes, fitting a good friend of mine for a driver on the simulator system. Uh, so even though I don't work for Callaway any longer, I was working with my, uh, the pro there, Jeff Coble and a good friend of mine. And we were hitting balls and uh, going through the process. And I got a text um, from one of the key Carl's guys and didn't believe it, pulled myself away to make a call and during that time that I was on the phone, um, I got several other texts uh, from other Carl's employees that I've you know, developed a relationship for over the years. And the level of shock um, and dismay uh, was overwhelming. And when I walked back over to see Jeff and my friend, uh, they were taken aback by, the, I think, the lack of color in my face. Mm. Um, it was uh, it was a bolt of devastating news. Um, I had been texting back and forth with Carl as recently as four days before his passing, and the sense that I was getting was that there was a corner being turned, and things were looking um, much more positive. Uh, so this caught me completely off guard, and uh, I can say I was very grateful that I was with two good friends who could see uh, my reaction to that 
and being with them um, helped me handle it. Uh, I made <laughs> the mistake of immediately calling my wife. And as Pete knows very well, uh, my wife and Carl had a, a fantastic relationship and uh, she was devastated as well. So it's a, it, it's a morning that uh, uh, it was a, a very painful start, but it started this process of me, you know, revising and going through everything and realizing the importance that this man played in my life, both personally and professionally. Hmm. How about you, Jim? Where, what was your situation when you got the news? I was actually at home and I was sitting in front of my uh, computer planning a trip, I think, or, or getting ready to plan a trip. And I got a text and I didn't, I had not stayed in touch with Carl recently. So I didn't know where he was health wise. And I'll tell you, uh, I mean, I just, I remember my heart just pounding, just there was a physical change, you know, immediately. And there was, you know, I got to find out more. I got to find out, got to find out what's going on. And then the, all the communication started. But um, it was, as Brian kind of alluded to, just total disbelief on my part. It caught me totally by surprise. You know, Peter, I think about all of this from your perspective, having been in the belly of the beast for so long, you're obviously connected to those you worked with up until you retired. And I would have to think you've got connections to some who are there now. What was the overall mood of the team from inside the ropes? Um, I, I have not been back into Carl's since I got the news on Friday. Um, I think it is uh, extremely surprised and somber. Um, I know for the people that are on the, the higher end of the, uh, the management team, uh, they're deeply saddened, obviously. And, uh, you know, um, most of the people there have been, you know, we call them, you know, long-term or, you know, it, they've made a career out of being at Carl's. So it is, uh, it, it, it is a sad time, you know, um, in, you know, for the entire staff, uh, it, it's funny. I, I, I was in a, in a Carl's a few times this summer, uh, doing some different things. Unfortunately, I'm, I wasn't smart enough to stay retired. So I, <laughs> I now work for a head cover company that's local in Rochester Hills called uh, the Winston collection. So we were doing some spec testing of, uh, drivers head sizes because these, these darn ping, uh, Drivers are too wide from uh, from face to back of head, and the, that little weight notch catches on the uh, the inner uh, the inner lining. So I was actually uh, I was in there uh, last week, actually, uh, either on Monday or the Friday before, and nobody else is around. It might have been the Friday before because uh, three of the executives, uh, Casey, Derek, and uh, Scott, were all down at. Uh, the U of M football game. So it might've been on the Monday then. Um, Cause they were all at the, at the game. And Carl said, Hey, you know, he was there and we sat down, we, you know, sat in his office and talked for, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. And he came, gave me the rundown on how everything had gone. Um, it was a pretty well kept secret, even amongst the staff all summer that, you know, he was going through a, a bout with, uh, you know, throat cancer and, um, you know, he, he was, uh, he was pretty enthusiastic, you know, he'd just gotten his PET scan back and he was, you know, they thought he was cancer free. And unfortunately the, the devastating effect on all the organs when you go through the radiation is it weakens everything. And, you know, and that's probably what happened, um, you know, unfortunately. Um, I was here in my office, uh, at my my new workplace, which was supposedly a part-time gig. And now I'm, you know, I, I don't know any better. I'm, you know, working not as many hours as I did at Carl's, but, you know, I, I'm plowing away at it. Um, I was, uh, I was in shock. Uh, 
given the the you know the uh, conversation that Carl and I had had, and he was showing me how he had to do you know this mouth re rehab uh, physical therapy about you know opening and closing his jaw because again everything is affected when you go through that treatment and you know we were laughing about it and he you know he's like I, I can't eat and I can't do this and but I said you're getting through it and you know he was he was very optimistic and uh, so I was. I was taken aback and it was, it's been a tough weekend. I, I, I'll say a uh, lot of, a uh, lot of memories, a lot of, you know, just a lot of thoughts, you know, you know, just thinking backwards. So. We have a, um, a general disconnection as, uh, as a golfer, who's not, you know, kind of in the industry, you don't really stop very often and think about the, personalities, the names, the families that are involved in where you just went and bought your putter. You just don't think you just go into the store. It's called Carl's. They have a good price. You go in, maybe you get fit and you have a good transaction. Maybe you need to meet a salesperson that you like, but it's not like you're digging into the story behind the purchase you just made. So for most of the golf world, they know the big orange graphics. They know the commercials They've probably hit some balls at Carl's at some point, um, whether they are from the Detroit area or not. They, you know, driving down through, you got to go to this place called Carl's and, and check it out. And yet, as the three of you have done such a, a great job of doing over the last half hour, you've helped paint that connection between the retail experience and the people behind it. Uh, and so I want to take one more lap around the horn and ask each of you, what you would most like our audience to know about Carl Jr., but not from the business standpoint, from the your friend standpoint, what is it you would like people to know that they most likely have absolutely no idea about? And um, Jim, I think we'll start with you. What what would you like people to hear? Well, <clears throat> first of all, that, that bat that both Brian and um, Pete referenced really you know played no favorites <laughs> he would um yeah he would take that out on anyone at any time in any meeting so the story about uh brian's boss is certainly believable but let me tell you it wasn't only to the bosses that he'd take that bad out on i've had <laughs> personal experiences of uh of uh I would say not hand to hand combat, <laughs> but as close as possible to that as you could as you could be. Yet there was um I try to control myself a little bit here. Hey, I love. <clears throat> a true love and he would tell you i love you <laughs> you know right shortly after you got done having probably i mean really a significant conflict <laughs> but he really did he was he had a huge heart hmm. and uh, i think that's what i remember most yeah that's so good Peter, what would you like people to hear about your friend, Carl? Carl was an authentic person. Love him or hate him, he was he was who he was, and he wasn't going to change, whether it was for the cleaning lady or the CEO of TaylorMade or Callaway. He was the same person, and he, he demanded... Um, he demanded respect and and the same effort that he was going to give in in making it a, a successful transaction with the cleaning lady or the CEO of a major company. Um, his father, uh, who who not only tutored him but myself as we were young men, he's a couple years old. He was a couple years older than me. Um, one of our uh, philosophies was we don't have to be the biggest 
But whatever we do in this business, we want to be the best. And that was one of the, you know, the the grounding principles of how we operated Carl's Golf Land and how we tried to treat our customers <laughs> and how we tried to treat our people. Carl, for as as material as he could, could be, had a huge heart. You know, he might, yes, he might yell and scream at people, but at the end of the day, he cared about them. Um, I'll give you a small story. Uh, there's a bank of Carl, which is kept in a, in a green file folder in his office. If he had a certain employee or even a friend that was going through a tough time financially, the bank of Carl was open for loans. Hmm. And one day I said to him, I don't know, probably a decade ago, I said, Carl, I said, how's that bank doing? <laughs> I said, I've seen a lot of loans going out, but I, I don't know that I've ever seen, seen anything being repaid. He's like, yeah. I get some payments, you know, there's some, there's some people that make a monthly payment. It's like $30 a month or $40 a month. So the, the bank of Carl right now, you know, his, his poor wife's probably going to find out is probably about a hundred K in, 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 in yeah. arrears to all the loans that he's made to all these people over the years to help them out because he genuinely cared. Hmm. I mean, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it's, he was hot or cold, but when he, you know, but he was, there was, there, there was a huge heart underneath that exterior and that, uh, you know, as we call, you know, the cleanup on aisle six, those are all, those are, I, I would say minor, not minor, but they, they just, you know, at the end of the day, he, you know, he cared about his people. He cared about people in general. And, um, uh, you know he'll be missed by by a lot of the people in the in the industry and just people that he knew. So, well, Brian, you helped bring together this band of brothers. So I'll let you have the final word on uh, your friend Carl. Well, there's uh, there's two quickies I'd like to to share. Um, I know Pete is aware of one of them. Um, when my mother was in hospice uh, and passing away at a facility close to the store on Woodward Avenue in 2014. Um, I would visit her pretty regularly. Um, and she remained in really remarkably good mental shape as her body was uh, really starting to, to deteriorate. And every once in a while, she'd have a flare up and say something that didn't make a whole lot of sense. But I went in to see her one morning and she said, I had a visitor last night. And we only had no idea where this was coming from. She said, yeah, Carl came in, snuck past the guards and brought me a frosty. <laughs> and I said, mom, um, well, you know, visitors aren't allowed at night. And she goes, go look at the trash. And I went over to the trash and sure enough, there was a frosty empty there. So I immediately went after seeing mom and I went okay. over to Carl's and went upstairs and knocked on his door and went in the office. I said, I heard you were making your rounds last night. He goes, she wasn't supposed to say. <laughs> so the things that Carl did that nobody knew about that may have belied some of his personality quirks. The last one I will share with you is a couple CEOs after Mr. Calloway passed away. Uh, were challenging, as Pete would um, acknowledge. And at one point, uh, there was an exchange between Carl and this CEO uh, that was rather rambunctious and was probably going to cause Pete and I to have to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. <laughs> and I got a call from this CEO and says, I just don't understand, Carl. I don't know if he's worth the trouble. Oh, geez. And I said, well, let me just tell you this, and I will explain this as clear as I can. I'm a pretty clean shooter. I said, if I got thrown in jail, the first person I would call is Carl Rose. Not my wife, not my brothers, not my parents. And he said, why on earth would you do that? I said, because Carl would come and get me out to make sure I was all right. 
And then when he was taking me wherever I'm supposed to go, he'd ask me what kind of fool nonsense I did to get me thrown in jail. But the first thing he would do is to make sure that I was taken care of. Mm. And I said, so if you can grasp the fact that this guy that you think is just all hellfire and brimstone isn't worth the trouble, I'm telling you, there was an honesty and an authenticity to this man. And that's what I'm going to miss the most. Mm -hmm. But his legacy will live on. And uh, you've got two people that I respect as much as any that I've ever met, both personally and professionally on this podcast with you, Bill. And when they say there's some greatness to this man, you can take that to heart. And uh, the tributes for him will continue to roll in but there's very few people in our industry that knew him as well as the people on this podcast. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share. Well, I'm grateful for the three of you doing that and helping to kind of peel back a little bit and let us see behind the curtain of what it is that made Carl such a special man. And a few years ago, we had a similar conversation after the passing of Carl senior, uh, that, that store is more than just a logo. It's more than just a brand. It is the result of passion. It is the result of family. And it is also the result of relationships built with representatives like the three of you and many, many others throughout the years. So thank you for, uh, for kind of giving us a, a eulogy type of experience with a few laughs along the way. And now I know I need to find a place to get a foldable, foldable yellow bat. I don't know. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> but, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.